All right, let's go ahead and get started. And if anybody does miss the beginning of this uh, webinar, it will be made available on the AMDA website shortly. Um, so with that, hello everyone, thank you for participating in today's Zoom meeting on evaluating gene therapies for Pompe disease, clinical trial goals and assessments. Today's, today's guest speakers are Dr. Jordi diaz Minera, who is a professor at Newcastle University, Christine Brown, who's an associate director at pa Patient Centricity at Estellas, and Dr. Mark Walzer, director of clinical development at Estellas Gene Therapy. As we go through the presentation today, you can send questions at any time by clicking the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. The guest speakers will answer the questions at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Christine. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tiffany. We are really excited to be with you here this afternoon uh, to share a little bit about um, our company and our work, but most importantly, um, sharing information about what assessments are currently being used and why in gene therapy trials uh, for Pompeii. So I'm assuming you all can, can see my screen, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So again, I just want to share our agenda. Um, I will start and just give you a little bit of overview about our company and our work. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mark Waltzer, who's going to talk about our work in gene therapy and clinical trials. And then really the bulk of the presentation today will be with uh, Dr. Jordi Diaz. Um, Christine, yeah. just to interrupt you for a second, you're on presenter view. Aha. Hold on one second, let me stop. I have a feeling I probably shared the wrong screen. Here we go. There you go, perfect. Fantastic, you would think that, you know, after COVID and all of us doing these things, that uh, we would uh, know how to operate all of our technology. Um, and then the, the bulk of our, our time with you this afternoon will really be with Dr. Jordi diaz Minera, who will talk about the different assessments that are used in uh, gene therapy clinical trials. And then we will open up to questions and answers um, at the end. So you've already seen the, the three of us. So at Estellas, our mission is to discover, develop, and deliver breakthrough gene therapies with life-changing value um, for patients with uh, few or little treatment options um, across many disease areas. And to me, what's interesting about Estellas, I've been with the uh, company for about four months, um, is that we um, are a, a larger pharma company um, that also works in larger indications. So not just in rare diseases and gene therapy, um, but in other larger uh, indications um, with a global headquarters actually uh, in Japan. Um, and we actually have over 14,000 uh, employees. Uh, to me, what makes it special is that uh, we do have a, a rare disease gene therapy program. And through that, um, the company acquired another company called Adentis back in 2020 that was working on a, a, a Pompeii program that now has come over to Estellas. And what's really, I think, unique about our company is we do have you know, leading class scientists and researchers with expertise in gene therapy and rare diseases, but now that's supported by a larger infrastructure of a company with many years of experience um, bringing different products to market. So as Tiffany said, I work at Estellas in the patient's uh, centricity or patient partnerships team. And overall, our team works with over 100 organizations across the world, um, covering more than 29 countries. We are working on currently 44 different projects. Um, all of the work that I do uh, is in rare diseases. 
And I do just like to talk a little bit about how we operate um, as a company. So as um, a person working in patient, patient partnerships, it's my job to actually bring your expertise and your insight into the drug development process uh, here at Astellas. And you know, we have um, very strong values um, and the way that we work, uh, very similar to patient advocacy organizations like AMDA and the core mission and values that you do your work on. So we really look at prioritizing a long-term commitment with the patient community, working together uh, in partnership with patient organizations to advance you know, goals that we all have. Um, really um, is important to us is that we're very transparent in our work, um, in our financials, and um, with all of the patient organizations that we work with. You know, obviously we really value um, you as patients, your time, and um, also your, your privacy uh, and your expertise and what you do um, to help us um, bring forward new treatments for rare diseases like Pompeii and making sure that also what we're developing is really what the community wants. Underlying all of this is obviously adhering to high ethical standards. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark, who is gonna tell you more about our particular work in gene therapy. Mark? Yeah, thanks, Christine. Uh, so Stellas, as Christine said, has a few programs now in the clinic or in the discovery that have been um, publicly disclosed. And I've just listed them here. You can find more information, of course, on the Stellas uh, public website. Uh, the one we'll focus on here today is the Pompe disease program, where, uh, of course, we're targeting the GAA, a gene and uh, the candidate compound is the A45 that Estellas has. But for this webinar, I think we'll think a little bit more broadly on what are the various uh, three targets that most people go after in, in the space of uh, gene therapy for Pompeii. Go to the next. So just an introduction to gene therapy, for, for those of you who are not as familiar, um, Estellas' approach is to use uh, at adeno-associated virus, so AAV virus, um, and this approach is called an AAV-mediated gene therapy approach. Um, what we're trying to do is take a healthy gene, in this case the GAA gene, and insert it into a viral vector, um, so virus, and that viral vector then will be uh, uh, injected into the patients, and the gene will then be allowed to um, turn on, basically, in cells that, uh, that are affected in, in the in this disease, so on Pompe disease. In terms of viruses, people think of them as, you know, big buckets, uh, kind of a bad virus, which are like um, the microbes that would, would be involved with COVID infection and so forth. And then there's also good viruses that don't replicate as well. And these are the viral vectors that we're using for gene therapy. So they, we've removed a lot of that uh, replication machinery and the viruses that won't replicate um, on their own, but they'll, they'll express the, um, the protein of interest via the cell's um, uh, biological machine. Uh, next slide. So a couple different uh, areas, and just to reintroduce you again to Pompeii, of course, I don't need to introduce this group to the disease, but what we're targeting on the right-hand side is basically the GA enzyme. So that's the acid alpha glucosidase enzyme, the primary enzyme that's um, impacted in Pompeii disease. And it leads to a loss of glycogen breakdown. And so glycogen builds up more in these cells that are affected. And specifically in muscle cells, the example here, you'll see a lot of muscle weakness and muscle damage and so forth over time. Um, Pompeii disease is not just a, a disease affecting muscles. CNS is also affected, and you'll see uh, there are some targets in the gene therapy space to more the CNS mediated effects. Uh, next. So we bucket these types of gene therapies that are currently being investigated either in clinical trials or even in non clinical studies in the research space. We bucket them into kind of three areas. Um, you'll see down in these colored boxes, we have a, a liver-directed gene therapy that's investigated by various investigators. We've got a CNS, a directed gene therapy, and then there's also muscle-directed gene therapy that, again, in Stellis' compound is a muscle-directed gene therapy. Um, they all have pros and cons, and um, we'll walk through a couple of those in the next couple of slides. 
Uh, so the first one to present here is the liver direct gene therapy, and um, it's it's as the name implies. You would inject the virus into the body, usually via an infusion, and that that virus would go to the liver, and in the uh, hepatocytes in the liver cells, they would start making GA, and that GA could then be circulated throughout the body. And uh, you see in the diagram, of course, the heart we get access to GA, muscle, brain, um, to some limited degree. And in this sense, um, there's a lot of advantages to driving expression in the liver because uh, it can get across uh, a large um, portion of the body with many areas that are affected. However, it, it has some issues in terms of it doesn't have a lot of good brain penetration. Um, and the cells that are affected, for example, the muscle cells, would have to then uptake the, the GA into the muscle cells for it to to work rather than expressing it in their own cell, they would have to uptake the GAA. So some advantages and some limitations for each of these. Um, the next one we'll hit is um, the CNS directed approach. This is probably more in the research phase right now. Uh, we need to have very good viruses that can get into the CNS is a, is a big issue in the space currently. But what the CNS-directed uh, gene therapy would do would be either injecting it systemically, be again an infusion, or sometimes directly, uh, directly into the central nervous system, into the, the spinal cord. Um, you can then express the, the GAA construct specifically in CNS um, tissue. And so those cells will take up the virus and express a GAA specifically in the cell that took up the virus. Uh, so it has, of course, some limitations where you're mainly just targeting CNS cells. So you're going to have limited impact, um, likely to the, the other cell types, for the example, the muscle um, issues. But you may have uh, maybe a better um, improvement in, in some of the dysfunction that occurs in the, the CNS cells. Uh, and the last one we'll talk about is just uh, to introduce you to, again, the muscle-directed gene therapy. So here, the virus is directed again systemically. It's infused into the body. The virus is then taken up directly into muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells, and um, and the GAA is expressed directly in, in the muscle itself and can help those cells uh, uh, hopefully uh, minimize the damage that's done by uh, too much glycogen, but will break down the glycogen then specifically in those cells. Uh, Couple of the limitations, of course, is um, the high doses that are needed. Because there's obviously a lot of muscle in the body, and you would have you want to infect as much of the muscle that's um, impacted as possible. So the doses are, are fairly high. They're given, and of course, with those high doses come uh, immune reactions to to the virus itself. So again, some limitations, some pros and cons. Uh, currently, these are all being investigated at some at some level, either in clinic or in research, and uh, in time, it will be uh, more apparent which ones um, kind of come to the top and which ones make it to a stages of approval and which ones can improve the disease and the various phenotypes that we see. Um, I think, Christine, I think that's all for me. The next part of the talk, we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Jordi diaz Minera uh, to focus more on uh, what you'd see if you're in a clinical trial for gene therapy basis. Thank you very much, Mark, and I would like to start by thanking uh, AMDA for organizing this webinar and for Astella also for inviting me to, to present. Um, so as Mark has said, we are running clinical trials now in pompe disease with gene therapy. And I think it is important that everybody understands what are we looking for when we do this study. So in a clinical trial, we want to understand different things. Uh, the, First and most important is the safety. Safety of a product is, is the most essential thing that we need to test in a clinical trial, whatever the status of the clinical trial is. It's either phase one or phase two or phase three. Safety is always very important. So we want to know what are the risks for the patients, uh, if this risk can be avoided, how severe are these risks, if this can be a minor adverse effect or it's a severe adverse effect. That's very important. So that's the reason why 
I don't know, you have participated in a clinical trial, but if you participate, you will see that there are lots of questions about safety. Tolerability is the second thing. So we want to know if the drug is tolerable because sometimes patients can develop side effects, but, this, but these side effects can be tolerated by the patient. And then it is worthy sometimes, uh, depending on the efficacy of the drug, to have a potential adverse effect. And the third thing is efficacy. Of course, when we discuss with patients clinical trials, they are always interested about how efficacious this drug is. And we are also very interested in knowing if the drug works at the biochemical level, at the muscle level, at the functional level. But without knowing safety and tolerability, we cannot go ahead and uh, commercialize a drug. That's the reason why we always need to look for these three things. Can you go to the next slide, please? So um, one of the first things that you will see in a clinical trial is that there are going to be inclusion and exclusion criteria. Why is this? So inclusion and exclusion criteria are needed to define a population that can respond to the treatment. Uh, of course, doing a clinical trial means investing lots of millions in developing a drug, and companies need to be sure that the drug, the, the population that is selected for the trial is the one that can respond better to this treatment. Uh, they, they need to demonstrate in a trial that the drug is working. That's the reason why we are looking to going to look at age, for example. In general, pediatric patients are more difficult to recruit in trials, unless this is a pediatric disease, of course, but if you have adult or pediatric patients, adults are always easier from an ethic point of view. We are going to look at genetic results, respiratory function, for example, uh, patients that can have uh, uh, enough muscle function to respond to a drug, if patients have participated in other trials, etc. One important thing for the gene therapy studies is the uh, existence of results for the antibodies. Why is that? Because patients that have antibodies against the virus are probably going to respond less to the treatment and they are in general excluded from uh, uh, the studies that are now going on. It is true that there is a lot of research trying to include these patients and treat these patients with immunosuppressive drugs, but by today, in most of the clinical trials in gene therapy, patients that have antibodies against the, the virus that carries the, the gene are excluded from, this, uh, from these studies. Can we go to the next slide, please? So, uh, as you can see here, there are different uh, stages in a study. So everything starts with the screening. So the first thing that we clinicians do with patients is to contact patients, uh, start, uh, identify a patient that can be candidate because uh, all the inclusion criteria are fit, inform the patient about the trial, uh, stay, uh, explain uh, in a detailed way what it means for the patient, what is going to be the burden to participate in a study. And if the patient um, accepts, they need to sign a consent form. This can take sometimes a few hours of discussion, especially in gene therapy, because we want to be sure that patients have enough time to patients and relatives, not only patients, have enough time to read all the documents, to ask questions, and these questions are answered in a proper way. So we want to be sure that the patients know everything about the study before they enter into the study. And we cannot do any other test, not even blood samples or check muscle strength or do any of the tests of the study until the patients have signed the consent form. Once this is done, we are going to do all the tests that are needed to confirm that the patient fits with the inclusion criteria. That this is muscle studies, respiratory studies, uh, lab-based uh, assays, etc. Then patient enter into the study and we do the treatment. So patients are going to receive the treatment in gene therapy study, they receive the treatment just once because there is one injection only. And in general, the patients are admitted at the hospital, spend one night there. We are looking very carefully at all potential adverse effects that the patient can have during the first 24 hours. Then they are discharged, but come to the hospital almost every day during the first week and then weekly for one month. And after one month, we relax a bit. The, uh, the follow-up and patients are coming. Uh, uh, progressively. When 
uh, when we have a first patient that is treated around the world, that's a very special situation because that's the first patient that is going to receive the drug. So that patient is going to be look very carefully just to see if we can collect information that can inform the other patients that are going to be treated after. And what happens in general is that in these studies that are phase one, that are starting, there are just a limited number of patients that are recruit. And this means that after the first patient is treated, the company will collect all the data and will give green light to have a second patient treated in a different part of the world and so on. So the second patient will allow to have a third one, the third one will allow to have a fourth one, et cetera. So the, after the patients have received the treatment, we are of course going to follow up them very carefully and observe not only if the patients improve or stabilize from a functional point of view, but we also want to know if they, they develop any adverse effect, they tolerate the drug well after one year of treatment, and if there is a maintained expression of the protein. And in general, in the trials, we are going to do uh, an observation for one year, but the reality is that there is an extended observation that will last at least five years. Can you go to the next slide, please? So in clinical trials, we are going to look at two different types of biomarkers. One are the safety biomarkers that are the ones that are going to inform us about adverse effects. And these are mainly the clinical interview with the patient. Patients are going to tell us how they feel, if they have developed diarrhea, or they have a headache, or they have any other medical problem. But we are also going to look at different uh, blood and urine assays to check, for example, kidney function, liver function, et cetera. And then there are what we call the efficacy bio biomarkers. So with these efficacy biomarkers, what we want to know is if there is a response to the drug. And this response to the drug can be from a biochemical point of view. So to, to uh, look at the muscle and see if there is protein expression, uh, to see if the activity of the enzyme is increased, to see if there is a reduction of glycogen. And also, of course, other functional biomarkers that are functional tests. Now I'm going to show you some examples of functional tests. Can we go to the next slide? So um, I, I think it is important to, to think that we, we are treating here a muscle disease, of course, but we want to also look at other areas of the body that can be affected in uh, pompe disease. And some of these areas can be affected directly because the disease can damage, for example, the central nervous system and others indirectly. For example, we are going to have a look to the heart of the patients. Of course, we know that in late onset pompe disease, the heart is generally not affected, but we want to be sure that if the expression of the gene is also in the heart, this is not damaging the heart. We want to look at uh, the respiration, so how, how the patient is breathing and if there is any problem with that. We are going to look as, as well as other gastrointestinal problems, for example, and to see if the patient has, are uh, gaining weight or the patient have any problem from that point of view. And we, can, of course, want to uh, have a look to muscle bones and joints and see if patients improve or if they worsen their condition after the treatment. Can we go to the next slide, please? So in, in, patient, in uh, clinical trials, we are going to look at different types of measure. One of the measures are going to be what we call performance outcome assessments. So these are, for example, the tests that patients are going to do. These are the tests that are defined before the, the study starts, and this will allow us to understand if the drug is safe or the, the patients are responding. Then we have for example, the, what we call the clinician reported outcome measures. And these are uh, what we clinicians try to find in the clinical examination. One potential example could be listening for wheezing in a length exam, or can also be doing the neurological examination and trying to see if the patient is, in my opinion, improving, is stable, or has worsened. And very important, we are also interested in knowing what the what is the opinion of the patient? In, and this is what we call the patient reported outcome measure, the PROMS. And one potential option could be a pain scale or a daily life, uh, activities of daily life scale or quality of life scale. So all these scales that patients are going to feel will inform us about changes in the clinical condition of the patient based on the opinion of patients. Can we go to the next slide, please? 
So why do we use these specific assessments? We want to use these specific assessments because we need to compare our drug with other medicines that can be in the market. In this case, in Pompe disease, there are three drugs already in the market, so we want to compare these. Uh, we want to also uh, check for new assessments in the future. Of course, if based on the feedback of the patients, we can develop new assessments that can be more uh, specific of the disease. And sometimes what happens is that there are not other assessments that are suitable, and then we need to use the ones that we have already designed and we have in place for the clinical trials. Can we go to the next slide? So just to show you some examples here, when we want to look at outcomes, there are outcomes that can be used to look, for example, at the function of the central nervous system. And one of them example could be a scales of intelligence. That is something that is done, especially in pediatric population, when we want to see that there is a normal development of the brain. We want to check the heart. We can do electrocardiogram or a heart ultrasound and, echo, and what we call echocardiography. We want to look at the respiratory function. We use in general a spirometry and check for hospital capacity, MEP and MEP. We want to uh, check the muscle function. We use and generally use motor function tests, like for example the six minutes walking test or the GSGC, which is a scale where patients need to do some activities related with standing up from a chair, standing up from the floor, or walking or going upstairs. And then, as I said, there are some prompts, which are patient reported outcome measures that can measure, for example, the impact of the drug in person's life. And one potential example could be the EDPAC, which is a daily life activities scale, especially designed for patients with pain. Can we move to the next slide? So just to show you some examples. So for hospital capacity, for example, it's it's a very common test. I'm sure that you are very familiar because it's used in the standard care of patients with Pompe. And here, what we want to measure basically is the force vital capacity. So the force vital capacity is the total amount of air that you can exhale after the deepest breath possible. And this is informing us about the strength of the muscles that control respiration. So this is the diaphragm muscle mainly, but there are also intercostal muscles and some muscles of the neck that help to open when we inhale and close, squeeze the lungs when we exhale. So you are familiar with this, I'm pretty sure, and you are also familiar with doing this in sitting and lying position, because when we do these two tests in this test, in these two positions, what we are looking for is for the uh, strength of the diaphragm, because if there is diaphragm weakness, there is a decrease in the force vital capacity, at least 10% between sitting and lying. So that is indicative of a weakness of the diaphragm. So force vital capacity, spirometry, it's a common test in all clinical trials because inform us about the strength of the respiratory muscles. Next slide. So MIP and MEP are also measures of uh, muscle strength of the respiratory um, muscles. So MIP is basically the air pressure when you breathe in as deeply as possible through a fixed opening. Like it's like sucking a straw, like don't doing something like this, what I'm just uh, mimicking here. And MEP is just the other way around. Is there pressure when you breathe out as deeply as possible against a fixed opening? So it's like blowing as hard as possible through a straw. And this is uh, allowing us to understand again, what is the strength of the muscle that participates in inspiration and expiration, which are, of course, intercostal and diaphragmatic muscles. So when I look as a clinician, when I when I look at a patient and I look at the uh, spirometry, I try to look at these three factors together. So because these are informative about how is the muscle, the respiratory muscle strength of a patient. In a clinical trial, we in general choose one of them as an outcome measure, but we do the three of them because this help us to understand better what is the effect of the drug in the strength of these uh, respiratory muscles. Let's move to the next slide. So the six minutes working test, I'm sure that you are very familiar with that. What we are mainly asking the patient is to walk for six minutes. Uh, what we do is we, we use a corridor in general and that there is a circuit of 25 meters and the patient needs to go around these circuits and we calculate the distance that the patient has covered in these six minutes. 
So this is a study that some patients can be fatigued, of course, sometimes they need to stop. Uh, in general, we don't allow the patients to stop because we want to be sure that the patient can uh, um, breathe the maximum distance possible, but some of them sometimes needs to stop and breathe, or sometimes in some studies, we allow the patients to do the six minutes walking test with some aids for walking. So for example, if patients are using a sticks, we can also uh, allow that. There are trials where uh, um, these aids for walking are not allowed for the simple reason that it can they can uh, induce some variability in the distance that is covered because some patients are more handy with the sticks, others are less handy with that. And that's the reason why sometimes patients are not allowed to use a stick when they are doing the six minutes working test. The six minutes working test is talking about or is providing data about muscle strength, but, it's made, but also muscle endurance, for example, and resistance, of course, and also fatigue. So it's not a specific test that is going to measure just one thing, is measuring multiple things, but it has them has demonstrated that correlates very well with quality of life and daily life activities. So even though there is a lot of criticism with this test because it's very general and not specific, the reality is that we have a lot of information in control population and in many diseases, and it's providing good quality data that allow us to understand if the patients are improving or worsening across disease, and of course, if patients respond to a treatment. Let's go to the next slide. So as I said, GSGC is a combination of these four tests that you have here on the screen. So we are going to look for how the patient can work 10 meters, how the patient can go up four steps, how uh, what's the time that patient needs to uh, stand up from the, the floor and also stand up from the chair. And we are going to quantify that using a numerical scale. And this is going to help us to have a general idea of how, uh, how is the patient from a motor point of view. Again, this is something that is not very used in clinics. It's more a test that we do in trials to try to understand better what is the uh, motor function of the patient. Next slide, please. So this is are some videos of myself doing some of the tests. For example, this is the 10 meter work. If you can please play here, what I am asked to run as, as quick as possible these 10 meters. So in the, in the test, what we do basically is to work or work as fast as possible. And we calculate uh, the time that patients need to cover this 10 meter work. So this test that is very simple has demonstrated to uh, be very useful to obtain changes in motor performance in patients after just one year of follow-up in many neuromuscular diseases, included pump. Next slide, please. So this is myself again. I'm going to do the clean up four steps. So this, these steps, of course, are not usual steps. It's a, a conventional steps. This is a, a stairs that are validated for clinical trial. The distance or the height of the step is always the same and it has demonstrated that is, that is uh, enough uh, to measure the, the capacity of the patients to, to, uh, to do this test in an a, in a ordered manner. So this is an easy test, as you can see, just going up four steps and calculating the time. Next one. And this is me doing two versions of the stuff from, stuff from the floor. Uh, again, what we are going to measure is the time that I need to go up from the floor. And we can do it being completely lying or in sitting position. So you can press play to the videos. I don't know if they are not running. So you can see this one is just from the lying position. And then you just need to go up. And this is more the sitting position for the patients that cannot lie. And it's again, just to calculate the time that we need to do that. Next slide. And this is the time to stand up from a chair. And here, what we are going to do, if you can increase is that I'm asked to do it. And then I need to go up, work three steps from, then backwards and sit again. And this is what we calculate. So all these tests are measuring muscle function, as you can see. When, when I see a patient in clinic, what we do is try to combine all these tests because they are going to be informative and they are going to generally tell us about the functional situation of the patient. In a trial, what we do is to select one of these as the primary outcome measure. So what is a primary outcome measure? Primary outcome measure is the measure that the, the trial or the company will select to 
see if there are changes in this in the in the muscle function after the treatment. So this is a patient reported outcome measure is the promise. So this is a scale that patient needs to fill. And basically here, there are lots of questions about different aspects of life. For example, how often did you feel run down? And then you need to answer never, rarely, sometimes, often, always. Or how often did you experience extreme exhaustion, etc. And what we want to do with this is to measure how the patient feel over time. Pretty easy to answer, a bit long sometimes, and patients, uh, um, but it's, it's giving us valuable information in general about how the patient is uh, uh, feeling in their daily life. Next slide, please. And this is the air pack. This is an interesting test in the case of Pompe because this is a test that was done with patients. So patients, this was developed by the Rotterdam team at the Erasmus Center. So what they did was to ask patients to meet one day and they were going through different symptoms that they had in their daily life. So they came out with uh, around 30 questions uh, about the, the life of the patients, what that was really relevant in patients with Pompe. For example, many patients had problems to comb their hair or to put on trousers or prepare meal, etc. And what the team did there was to try to reduce the questionnaire for 30 something questions to just 18 and demonstrated that with these 18 questions, they can cover very well many function of the daily life. And this is now a test that is used in clinics and also in clinical trials. It's translated to five different languages and validated in these languages. So it's a pretty uh, widespread test that maybe some of you are familiar with. And it's done either in clinics or in clinical trials. Next slide, please. So there are all the biomarkers that we are going to test so far. Everything that I have shown you is mainly the patient doing something. But in the trials, we are going to look for some for also biomarkers in the blood. For example, we are interested in knowing about the presence of antibodies against the GAA enzyme, because this can let us know about if the patient is uh, developing an immune response against the enzyme, for example, that is being expressed. Uh, creatine kinase, of course, this is a marker of muscle damage. So we, when there is a muscle disease, creatine kinase are, is increased, and we want to see if there are changes in the creatine kinase levels through the study. In patients that are responding well to a treatment in general, CK goes down. But uh, I, I want to say that CK is very variable through the day, so it's not a very good marker of disease progression. A slight vari variations in the in the CK figure doesn't really mean anything because they can vary with if you do exercise or if you have work that day. But of course, when the variation is of thousands or, or tens of thousands, then this is really meaningful. And then it can indicate that the patient is worsening or the patient is improving. And another biomarker is this X4. X4, it's a molecule that increases when there is too much glycogen in the skeletal of the cardiac muscles. And of course, it's a good way to measure that the enzyme is doing what it's supposed to do, that is exactly the great glycogen. So if patients with Pompe have elevated X4 levels in the urine, but when they are treated with drugs and the drugs work, these X4 levels go down and are reduced. This means that the drug is doing their work, what it's supposed to do, the job, in the muscle. But doesn't mean that the patient is improving. It's just telling you that the glycogen is being the remove from the muscle and metabolized. Let's go to the next slide, please. So potential limitations of gene therapy. As you have seen, gene therapy is now everywhere. There are lots of trials in many different diseases. In the case of Pompe, there have been uh, some trials already uh, um, uh, planned. And, and there are some limitations, of course. One of the limitations is what we call gene delivery. So we want to be sure that the gene arrives to all the cells of the body. Bear in mind that the skeletal muscle is the most abundant tissue. So if you weigh 70 kilos, almost 40 kilos of you are muscle. So this means that there are millions of cells in this muscle that need to receive a copy of the gene. When we, when we talk about gene delivery, we're exactly meaning that. So one of the limitations is to be sure that the virus, which is the carrier, is able to ar arrive to all these cells, infect the cells, and release one copy of the gene. 
So the immune response, of course, when you are expressing a gene that has never been, a pro the gene is transformed into a protein, and then you express that protein, a protein that your immune system has never seen, that can trigger an immune response, an immune response that will attack that protein and can destroy the protein. And therefore, this will reduce the, your response to the drug. But there can be also an immune response against the virus, because virus, of course, are recognized by the body as something that is a strain to us. And that's the reason why we treat patients with steroids during the first two months of the trial, trying to reduce the immune response. There are some practicalities. So the size of the virus is not like a, uh, uh, it's not very big. So this means that we cannot put all the genes that we want inside a, a virus. So there are some genes that do not fit and then they, we cannot treat patients with this strategy. And they ask for some diseases like Duchenne, which is a muscular dystrophies, that we are developing what we call mini dystrophins, which are reduced versions of the genes that can fit inside this virus. But unfortunately, this is not possible with all diseases. Then durability, how long the muscle is going to express that gene. Unfortunately, when the cells divide, they lost the expression of the gene, and the muscle is going to the tissue that divides, and, and over time we have and regenerates. So over time we are pro uh, producing new muscle cells. This means that these new cells do not have the gene, and they don't express the gene. So that's something that worries, of course, us, and we want to know for how long the muscles of a patient that has been treated with gene therapy are expressing that uh, protein, because this means that maybe we need to reinfuse the patient in the future. Safety, very important. And that's probably the most important uh, take home message of today. We always need to look for, uh, at safety very carefully. And we know that there are some potential damages of gene therapy, what we call the genotoxicity. So the DNA can produce some reaction in the cells and in some tissue and also the um, reaction produced by the virus that can produce inflammation in some organs. And of course, crossing the blood-brain barrier. So the virus that we use now do not cross the blood-brain barrier. This means that they don't go inside the brain and they, they are not useful for all the central nervous system disorders like Pompe. We know that Pompe can affect also the brain, especially in children. So that's a limitation. And there are some virus now that are being developed that can tackle, that can arrive to the brain uh, in a more effective way. So there is a lot of research trying to provide answer to all these limitations that you can see here. I'm sure that in the next 10 years, we're going to have better gene therapies that by today. Next slide, please. So I think that that's my last slide. Uh, I, I don't know if I sp have uh, spoken too much or for too longer, but that now we have some time to answer some of your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Diaz Monero. I think that was a wonderful presentation. And um, for everybody listening, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A and we're off. Um, in addition to the envelope, capsid vector word. Can you also comment on any word to optimize the enzyme plus tags promoters you're encoding as the pass package to set? Is, regarding the promoters is the question. Yes, of course. So there are, there are some research now trying to improve the promoters. So in the case of the muscle, the promoters that we are using are, is the creatine kinase which is a widely expressed uh, protein in the muscle that is produced continuously. So this is ensure that the, the gene is going to be only produced in the skeletal muscle because CKC is produced in the skeletal muscle and the heart, but is not produced in other tissues. Can be also produced, there are some, uh, some types of proteins that the, of CK that are also produced in the brain, so which is good if the virus could arrive there. But the CK is not producing the liver, for example, it's not producing the kidney, not producing the bone. So this means that even if the cells arrive, if the virus arrives to these cells, cells in the liver, in the kidney, in the bone, they will never produce the gene. So the gene is just produced by the cells that we are interested in. Thank you. Um, regarding the trial endpoints, personally, do you have any preferences? for what should be included. Yes. 
So I think that in, in the case of Pompe disease, we need to include a spirometry. That's that's very important because we know that it's a key point in patients. Uh, it's critical for patients with Pompe. So for vital capacity, of course, sitting and lying. And then uh, for the muscle function, I, I am hard. I am I, I think the six minutes working test, even though, as I said, there is a bit of criticism because uh, in some trials, six minutes working test has not been able to demonstrate changes. I think it's the best test that we have by today because it's providing a lot of information. We have a lot of data from controls. We have also a lot of data from patients with other diseases. Here in Newcastle, we are, for example, developing other muscle function tests. There is a test that is called NSAD, which is the North Stars um, assessment for patients with muscular dystrophies that can be applied to patients with Pompe. And it's a combination of functions that the patient needs to do and includes uh, proximal muscles of the upper limbs, proximal muscles of the lower limbs, which are the ones that are affected in Pompe. And I am, I am a fan of this, of this test because I think it's a very good one to follow up patients. But the reality is that it's not validated in Pompe. We are now working on that but we don't have large amount of patients with Pompe that have been tested with this. So there is a still work to be done. And if you allow me to extend my answer a bit more, mm -hmm. I am an MRI guy. So I have been working in MRI for many, many years. So I think that imaging is also a good outcome measure for clinical trials because it allows us to see the structure of the muscle, changes in the fat that is present in the muscle and can also be done in clinical trials. In fact, it is done in some trials and inform us about the changes in the structure after treatment, if this is improving or uh, stabilizes the, the fat content, which of course is uh, telling us about the response to the drug. I think that's you know a really interesting point, the muscle MRI, because the six minute walk test, for instance, if you already have significant mobility issues, it excludes a lot of patients from trials. So looking at things like muscle MRI may allow for other ways to um, evaluate patients. But we now have a lot of questions in the queue. So um, is it still the case that if you participate in a gene therapy clinical trial, you can't participate in another one in your lifetime. And I think that that's probably if you've been if you've been exposed to gene therapy. Yes, yeah, that's that's a good point. So the reality is that patients that have participated in a gene therapy clinical trial, they they we don't know enough today about what happens with them. So from a, a protein expression point of view, so the, imagine that that these trials are successful and then they can demonstrate that the treatment improve the amount of protein that the patient is expressing and they go from reduced levels to medium levels or something that is in between normal healthy person and a person with a, a Pompe disease. So it is very difficult to then design a trial for someone that this is pressing these intermediate levels. So this patient is not anymore a classical Pompe patient. It's a Pompe patient that has been treated with gene therapy, which means that the response, that the muscle can be different, the amount of protein that is expressed can be different, and they can behave in a different way. So that's the reason why by today, patients participated in a gene therapy trial are excluded from other trials. It doesn't mean that that's going to be what happens in the future. We don't know. So of course, when we will have more patients treated, we will know more, and maybe we will be able to open the door to of these patients to participate in other trials. For example, trials that try to infuse the, the, the gene therapy for a second time. This can only be done in patients that have received gene therapy once. Or for example, patients that are done with immune suppressors to see if the inflammatory response improves. This can also be done in patients that have just received gene therapy. So we don't really know what is going to happen, but by today, the reason why patients that have received gene therapy are excluded from other trials is because they cannot be considered a standard for the patients. They are producing some amount of the protein and they can behave in a different way. 
but again, there would be a distinction five years from now, say, if there's a commercial therapy, that would be a different situation. Yes, I think so. And and to be honest, it's very difficult to say what is going to happen because mm-hmm. this is a, so a new treatment that first we need to first uh, confirm that this works. So that is not only working from a biochemical point of view. So it's, it's not only the muscle that is showing more sign that the patients also respond to this treatment. They improve or they stabilize their function. Imagine that this is commercialized in five year time. Hopefully that's what's going to happen. But then the situation will be different because if we start treating patients with pompe with gene therapy, these are not pompe patients anymore. Are pompe patients treated with gene therapy? Which is a different thing. It's it's a, it, maybe they still have the disease, they still develop problems, but in a slower way. It's more or less the same situation that when we compare a patient that has never received the sign, um, like the, the enzymatic replacement therapy, with these patients that have received enzymatic replacement therapy. So today there is no discussion. Almost all patients that develop symptoms are treated. But when enzymatic replacement therapy was a starting, we there was a moment when there was a combination of patients naive and patients treated. And you cannot compare the progression of a patient naive with a patient treated because they're not the same. They are different types of patients. This is the same with gene therapy. Uh, for the next question, um, my 13-year-old son was diagnosed this January with Pompeii. He will soon begin ERG. What do you think the prospect is of successful gene therapy in his life? Uh, the question is about if this patient should have been treated with gene therapy. Yeah. Sorry? Do you think it's possible that there will be gene therapy in his lifetime? How old is the patient, sorry? 13. Oh, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that there's going to be gene therapy. So let's see, as I said, we need to be... Uh, careful, of course, when you want to see that gene therapy works. But today we are talking about the first version of gene therapy, what we can call gene therapy version 1.0. So it is, I'm sure that the limitations that you are, we are facing today are going to be, uh, we are going to be able to solve them in the future. And then we will have gene therapy version 2.0. And then we will have new limitation and we will sort them. That's uh, the nature of science, right? So I'm, I'm sure that if, if it's not with the therapies that we have now in trials, new therapies will arrive, new ways of doing gene therapy will arrive. So I'm pretty sure for this guy that, is going to, that he's going to be able to be treated with different treatments, hopefully gene therapy or maybe other treatments. But the research in Pompeii is incredible. There are lots of options that are now being tested. Um, so we have a question from Germany. Uh, what kind of cells is gene therapy aimed at? Those that are already damaged, for instance, can they be repaired? Or is it only looking at newly developed ones to prevent glycogen buildup? That's a fantastic question. So uh, we don't know. That's the first answer. So we what we think what is, is happening is that... Uh, the virus arrives to the cells and release the gene, and this gene is translated into the protein. So in a muscle fiber that does not have glycogen, in theory, this protein is going to avoid the glycogen to be accumulated. In a muscle fiber that contains glycogen in the lysosome, in theory, this protein goes inside the lysosome and it starts removing the glycogen. So what happens with these muscle fibers that are very ill and they have a lot of glycogen, but also autophagy vesicles, we still don't know if this treatment is effective in these fibers. It can happen that they are so ill that they don't respond, but we don't know. What is important is what happens in a muscle where there are not muscle fibers, where all muscle fibers died and the only thing that there is there is fat. So we, we don't expect these muscles to respond to the drug. And that's very important. So mm-hmm. we cannot tell the patients that all muscles are going to be restored and the muscles that have disappeared will come back because this is not going to happen. 
So if a patient, for example, we do an MRI, imagine, and we see that the gluteal muscles or the quadriceps muscles is completely gone, gene therapy is not bringing muscles back. Gene therapy is having an effect in those muscles that still contain muscle fibers. So this means that if you are a patient that are in a wheelchair and they are in a bad situation, gene therapy will probably maintain your status, will avoid you to progress, but patients cannot think, or I think it is wrong, the measures that this gene therapy will make the patients to work again, because this probably will not happen because muscles are so affected that, and they're probably replaced by fat that they will not improve enough to change that situation. But patients can, for example, start moving better the arms or feel that they are stronger or they can move better in the wheelchair when they are in that situation. That, of course, can happen. If a patient has an autoimmune disease in addition to Pompeii, can they be included in a trial? Mm, that's a good question as, as well. Yes, in theory, yes. This, it, it always depends on what is this immune disease and if this immune disease is controlled. For example, one of the risks of gene therapy, the trials that we have today, is that they can have uh, kidney reactions or uh, liver reactions. So if we have a patient that has an immune disease and the kidney is very affected and has a renal failure or has a liver failure, this is a patient that cannot participate because the risk of the compensating this situation is so high that patients cannot be included. Uh, but imagine that we have a patient that has an immune disorder that is controlled and is not affecting uh, uh, the, the liver, the kidney, or the lungs. So why not? I think that patients could be treated with immune therapy, uh, with uh, gene therapy, sorry. So that's, that's, a, that's I don't think that that's a, a no-go mm -hmm. per se. We need to go case by case. There is an actual follow-up question to that, and you mentioned it briefly. Um, what are the anticipated interactions with lifestyles, such as factors between liver and alcohol consumption, being that this is a liver-targeted, or most of them are liver-targeted gene therapies? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question for these gene therapies. And then I need probably to, to introduce a, a concept here, so in the case of Pompe, there are two main strategies. One strategy uh, is to bring the gene back to the muscle. So then the virus, when we inject the virus, the virus go everywhere, all the cells of the body, except the brain, remember, doesn't cross the, the brain blood barrier, but goes to the lungs, go to the kidney, go to the muscle, go to the liver, etc. And then because we have a promoter that is muscle specific, in these strategies, the muscle is the only one producing that. But there, are, there is a second strategy, that is the liver. So um, the idea there is that we, the liver is the organ that is going to retain most of the virus. At least 70% of the virus that are injected are retained by the liver. So it's an organ that is easily to tackle. Then you need you have an, a promoter that is liver specific. That means that is expressed there, but as can also be expressed in other organs because that that promoter is not so good. But this protein that is expressed in the liver is released to the bloodstream, circulate with the blood, and then is called, is taken from the blood by the muscle fibers. It's like being connected to ERT twenty four hours seven. So these trials are also going on and there are some tests and we need to see if these are working or not and what are the results. But of course, one of the problems is that if you have uh, an hepatitis, which is an inflammation of your liver, or you are taking drugs like that can affect the liver or you take alcohol that can damage the liver and means that you can lose the expression of the gene, which is exactly what we don't want. So, if you are participating in a gene therapy trial that is for the liver, alcohol is not good. You need to stop or reduce as much as possible that. In the future, if we have one of these treatments approved, then probably we will need to control liver function very closely and be sure that patients try to avoid uh, any drug or any toxic that can affect the liver. Um, there's still quite a few questions, so I hope you all don't mind hanging around for a bit longer. But no, okay. to that point of health of the liver, what about um, fatty liver disease? 
which is a concern with some of the diets for Pompeii. What about the liver disease? Fatty liver? Fatty liver disease, fatty liver disease, okay. So yes, fatty liver disease, it's, uh, it's something that can, that it means that there is kind of an inflammation in the liver. So it's mainly what is produced when you have fatty liver disease. So means that means that your liver is regenerating uh, because of the, of the damage. And this can lead to a progressive liver disorder. So is this a limitation for the, uh, the gene therapy? Not per se. Because what we need in these programs is to be sure that liver function is in the more or less normal range. But in my opinion, if I have a patient in front of me that wants to participate in a gene therapy trial and has a fatty liver disease and is not controlled and is worsening, and the liver function, I see that there is a trend to worsen, probably that, that is not the best candidate for a gene therapy, no matter if this is a liver or muscle one. I would probably recommend this patient not to participate in a gene therapy because the risk of having a liver problem is very high. So as I said, the liver retains most of, most of the virus and almost all patients in all gene therapy trial develop a bit of liver toxicity, which is normal. The virus is there. So the immune system attacks the virus and the virus itself can produce a bit of damage. So if you are a patient with a liver problem, probably you are not going to be allowed to participate in a trial with gene therapy. Would gene therapy target smooth muscle as well? That's a good question. That said that gene, the, the virus will arrive to the smooth muscle cells, but mm -hmm. it will not be produced. So because the, the promoter is skeletal muscle specific. So no, the answer is a smooth muscle cells are not producing the enzyme. Um, talking about MRI or other imaging techniques, are there techniques or ideas to develop which can contribute to validating the distribution of gene therapy? That's a good question. Uh, so the, the distribution of gene therapy, I would say that no, we can... There is now what there is a lot of research now trying to develop what is a, an MRI that can quantify so detect the glycogen and quantify that glycogen in different tissues. So there is a technique called carbon spectroscopy, which is what measures is the amount of carbon in the tissues, and we know that carbon is the main component of glycogen. So this is a that is it, unfortunately not only glycogen contains carbon, many tissues, many different. Uh, molecules contain carbon, for example, the lipids. But in the skeletal muscle, carbon spectroscopy can allow us to identify glycogen. And there are now a lot of research efforts to identify this glycogen. So a good way to measure if the drug is being effective could be to do MRI in different muscles and look at the glycogen and see the glycogen goes down, which of course will also talk about the distribution of the drug, the fact that the, the virus has arrived to these muscles. But as far as I'm aware, well, there, there are not other imaging modalities that can be used in this sense. I don't know, Mark, if you have the idea about anything else? Okay. No, I agree. I mean, we, we definitely measure in, in, um, in body fluids and body fluids that can be excreted and so forth to see the clearance of the virus, but there's no kind of detection in the whole body and the scanner. What are the future strategies to use a lower dose in um, in case of gene therapy that targets the muscle? Is it possible to target only leg muscles or arm muscles and use a lower dose per target? That's a good question as well. So the future strategy uh, is called what, what we call the Mayo AABs. So the virus that we are using are adeno associated virus. So these are virus that are um, modification that we do in the lab of adenovirus. Adenovirus are very common in nature. They produce diarrhea and sometimes like flu-like symptoms. And most of us, have been, we have been infected once in our life with an adenovirus. So... These viruses have been taken and have been modified in the lab 
and they are called adeno-associated virus. They are not adenovirus anymore. It's a different thing. It's a synthetic thing. So, but this virus, when injected, go to all the cells. So now the research tries to make, uh, to increase the efficiency of this virus going into the muscle. So what we do is basically decorate the capsid, so the external part of the virus, with molecules that recognize all the molecules that are just expressed in the muscle. And uh, th that way, we increase the amount of virus that go into the muscle and decrease the amount of mass uh, virus that are retained by the liver and go to other tissues. So this is called Mayo of muscle, myology, muscle, myo AADs. And there are lots now. There are many companies and many labs in the world trying to develop these myo AADs. So this weekend I was in a conference in California and one researcher was presenting the results of one of these myo AADs comparing with the conventional AADs and was showing that there is an increase, uh, efficacy, an increase um, distribution in the muscle uh, with a reduction in the amount of virus that go to other tissues. So it seems that works. If that works, this means that probably we will be able to reduce the dose that is needed to treat a patient. So that would be good, of course. So I'm going to ask another one where you need to have your crystal ball in front of you. And bearing in mind that gene therapy has been talked about in the Pompeii community since 2001 and probably even the 90s. But with your crystal ball, when can we realistically expect gene therapy to be available for patients suffering from LOPD? Wow. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough question, I would say. Let me, let me take my crystal ball because I have a crystal ball here. So I'm going to use this crystal ball that I have in front of me. <laughs> and uh, that's a very tough question. I don't know. So that's a reality. So uh, by today, gene therapy has been, uh, has obtained a fast track approval in the United States for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So it's a reality in a neuromuscular disease. I think it is important that we always talk about neuromuscular diseases because Pompe, it's a lysosomal storage disease, but it's in fact what affects is the skeletal muscle. So it is very similar to other diseases of the muscle. And this, as I said, uh, share many difficulties, like for example, this fact that it's a very abundant tissue, right? So in the case of neuromuscular diseases, there is only one disease. There are two diseases that have a gene therapy program that has been approved. One is Duchenne that has approved, that has received the, the fast track approval now. So these are good news because it means that FDA has reviewed the data provided by the companies and they consider that this data of enough quality that can be really a change in the natural, in the reality of the patients. However, the company uh, that has collected this has shown that long-term results are not as good as they, as they thought. And of course, they need to investigate more and, and have better products. The other disease that has a therapy that is gene therapy is spinal muscle atrophy. This affects the muscles, but the, the, the origin of the problem is in the nerve, in the nerves. It's in the neurons that make the muscles to move. And in this case, the, the therapy is very successful. And the main reason is because the neurons do not divide. So once you have treated them, they will always express that gene. So that's the main reason. So, um, I would say that with my crystal ball, I hope that there is gene therapy available in the market in the next six to seven, six to 10 years. But the reality is that this, that's a very tough question. We don't know. I prefer to say that there is research that patients need to see this as something that is already here. And as you see, I have whites in my hair and in my beard. So uh, in the eighties, gene therapy was already there. So mm -hmm. the first study that started in the 80s. And we are 40 years after, we are still doing research in this topic because it's a very complex topic. But the main difference is that in the 80s, we were doing research in cells and in animal models. And now the research is done with patients, which means that the, we are very close. We probably need to improve what we are doing, but we are very close, I think. 
Thank you. I know that was a very impossible to answer question, so I appreciate that. And um, for our final question, I think this is more for Christine and Mark. Um, when do you anticipate starting the gene therapy trial? If you can say. Sure. So uh, currently, you can see in clinicaltrials.gov, uh, there's a trial called Fortis. This is a phase one, two clinical trial, and Dr. Diaz Minera is one of our investigators for the trial. So that's currently ongoing at very limited uh, centers. Um, that is a, a dose ranging trial. So we're trying to understand dose and of course safety in, in terms of the initial studies in, in humans. So that trial is ongoing and then from that, we would have to move on to later stage trials to really prove more of the efficacy if the drug is working and, and safety in a much bigger population. So the trials have started, and like uh, Jordy said, um, um, the other liver directed gene therapy trials have also started, and um, some are ongoing, and, and some have been um, a pause for CMC uh, related activities. So there are trials, but the, the larger trials, um, uh, phase late phase two, phase three trials have not started yet. Thank you. And um, with that, I want to thank all of our speakers for uh, sharing their time and their wealth of knowledge with us today. And I also would like to remind everybody on the call that um, May 3rd through 5th of this year, we will be having um, the International AMDA IPA Pompeii Patient and Scientific Conference in San Antonio, Texas. And we would love to see you all there. It'll be another opportunity to where we dive deep into the science and understanding of living with Pompeii. And with that, this concludes today's webinar. And thank you everybody for participating. Thank you.